Okay, so that brings me to the preview of coming distractions. 63, everybody, first Matthew, then Luke, now Mark, uses the 63 as a date line. It means something different each time because they're running at different times. But they're using the same number. Why? First of all, because when Christ speaks, there are 63 years left on the clock until the millennium was supposed to happen. That's why he's talking. Israel, accept me now. And then there wouldn't have been a church. Okay? There wouldn't. The millennium would have happened, and we'd all not be here. That's the first reason. Second reason, when Matthew writes, okay, he's writing in 30 AD, so he's writing at the same time the Lord is talking. Wait a second. But Luke is writing 28 years later. And when he writes, he dated Luke 1 already and saying, Hi, I'm writing you 63 years after Elizabeth was told she was pregnant. And marry it, you know, six months later. Oh, so he, you know, that way you know that they're writing the material, you know, not at disparate times. Okay, but 63 has a doctrinal meaning of vote short. Okay, vote short. And in this particular case, in 30 AD, the thing that's so hysterical about it is that in 30 AD, if you subtract 63, you get when Augustus, he wasn't called Augustus then, comes to power. He hadn't finished winning over Anthony yet because he wasn't exactly Anthony's enemy yet. They were just getting started to be enemies. And he defeated Anthony. All right? Jerusalem is about to be defeated. That's the whole theme of this chapter. See? Now, Look at this for a minute and think about what you saw in the prior videos. What you saw was Christ standing there in 30 AD before everything happened saying, Believe it when I tell you. Now think of the import of getting that same quote later. But Luke didn't quote it later. Except once. Mark, therefore, is not going to quote it the six times that Matthew did either. But he makes sure, and this is the killer that proves that Mark wrote this. He makes sure to give you the first one and the second one. Just the first two. Alright? And he places it right at the 63rd syllable, whereas in Matthew, this phrase doesn't have hoti, and just this part of it ends without the E in there, at the 63rd syllable. So that's why I know Beza's copy is right, because the priests, the scribes, the Catholics, the Calvinists, that everybody in Christendom, they don't know about counting syllables to do prophetic annual prophecy. They don't know that this exists. Okay, I've been looking for proof that they know this exists. And they've done videos to show you that they had ideas that, well, maybe, but then nobody found it. So you're hearing it first. I hate to say that. I'm hoping that we'll someday find some manuscript to prove somebody knew about this. But Mark knew about it. And Beza's copy is right. Because that's exactly how Mark should be placing it. And in the Matthew text, this is exactly what the first time in Lego who means says. Except Matthew changes the verb. Not one stone be left upon another is what it still means. But... This thing here, ume, means never. The Lord didn't say it that way in Matthew. Okay? So, Luke, so Mark is inserting a pointed comment 
because the armies are already around Jerusalem. He's reminding them of what the Lord said. Never again. Now the never is actually doctrinally correct, but it's from Daniel. The quote in Matthew just uses this in a different flavor of the same verb. That's a little longer. But again, Mark is counting his syllables. He wants to make sure he hits 91 as his second date line. So he truncates the verb to another form. has the same meaning. But it's shorter, because Mark likes short. And he inserts this. <clears throat> now, in 2 Peter 3, 9, you see the same construction. In English, they translate it something like, God is, never, is not willing that anyone should perish. That's not what the Greek says. Those words highlighted in black are what the Greek says. And 2 Peter 3, 9 in the Greek says, those two words meaning, God is never willing that anyone should perish. Never. Never means never. Therefore, there's no such thing as soul sleep amongst other th conclusions that you can draw. In other words, all those people down in hell, this is the second conclusion. They can get out. Christ paid for everybody's sins, 1 John 2, 2. They can get out. They don't want to. But God is never willing to, like, terminate their souls. God is always going to wait and always going to provide information. That's why Christ went down to hell after he died. And say, hi, you know, I wanted to cross. You can believe me now. I mean, what more proof do you want? You're baking in this horrible place in the center of the earth. How, how do you like it? I bet you don't. I'm right here. See me? You can't pretend that it's something else. Here you are. You can see me. God is never willing that anyone should perish. That same construction highlighted in black right here is in 2 Peter 3, 9. And pretty much every scholar knows how to translate it as never, but they never do it right in English Bibles. I don't know why. Alright? So this is an update saying there will never, ever, never be a time when those human constructed stones will be upon another in the Temple Mount. Meaning, Ezekiel 40, really Ezekiel 37 is the second advent. Ezekiel 40, hi, the next time there's going to be a temple there, God builds it. The angel is the one who's measuring the foundation in Ezekiel 40, not a human. See, this is all doctrinally significant. So, notice the cleverness here. I know for sure that Beza's copy, the only Greek copy we got, that's early. I know his copy's right, and I know Mark wrote it. Now you see why? Because look at this, 91. Well, what happened 91 years before the, the 69 AD when Mark writes? Herod started his own rebuilding. You can check that in history. It's a question by some historians whether Herod started ruling in 40 B.C. That's what Mary said it was in her Magnificat because she dates from Herod. Or whether it was 37. Okay, our boy Josephus is being used way too much. And so he's using 37. But we can prove in history that Herod was appointed king in 40 B.C. by the Roman Senate. Okay, but you can play it either way. If you date it from 40 B.C., then Herod started, he got married, and he started building his own stuff. If you play it from 37 B.C., he started building the temple then. And of course, we got a three-year error in our calendars too. So, Herod started rebuilding. Temple, his own place, whatever you want to call it. Okay, but why is that relevant? Because no stone is going to be left on another, honey. Ever. So see, here you are, human. You're busy building, 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 building like Herod. And where is he now? Under the ground. Maybe in hell. So maybe what you want to build is what's on the inside of you that's going to live forever. Because God is never willing that you should perish. Just a question, where are you going to live after the, you quit this body? 
See how pointed that is? See how doctrinally significant and relevant to the text for him to use 91? Now you say, well, gee, Brainer, how could you know that? I mean, the 91 could reference anything. Uh-uh. 91 has only one meaning. Christ's age at the time the tribulation is supposed to start. It does have a, sub, a sort of secondary meaning of season, like in four seasons, each one being three months. But in prophecy, 91 is Christ's age when the tribulation was supposed to start had there been no church. See how all this fits? See how cute it is? And so 91 years back, every Jew would know what happened 91 years prior to when he's getting this. Because just as today, you can go to Aish.com and see it yourself. You know, download the Kaluach. That's Hebrew word for calendar. And they have in their little calendars. I don't have it on this computer. But it's like, okay, 1,488 years before now, uh, the temple was this. 15,222 years before that, Moses did that. Blah, blah, blah. They keep ongoing accounting records of what happened X number of years ago from now. So every Jew would have known 91 years before when Mark writes, and Jerusalem surrounded by armies just as being predicted right here what's going to happen next. That was when Herod was rebuilding, thinking that it was going to make him important and last forever. And it never, Ume, never will. See how cute this is? See how it's easy to know what the writer intends and how the meter helps you know? Okay? Now, I'm going to try to go a little bit faster with this because th those were the important things because they established the whole chapter. But see, now here's the next one. And this is a no-brainer if you just know Greek grammar. Somebody decided, oh, I should put a hall in front of Peter's name, Petros. It's Greek for little chip. It doesn't mean big stone. It doesn't have Matthew 16, 18, meaning that the Catholics lie about. Petros means a chip. You know, like little rock. That's what it means. Alright? You don't put a hoe in front of just one guy's name. Actually, it's not even proper Greek to do it, but everybody did it, and the Bible does it a lot. You don't just put... The definite article in front of that Peter. See, ho Petros means a particular one who you're expected to know. Okay, but you don't put it just there and not have it in front of Jacob, a.k.a. James, and Ioannis, a.k.a. John, and Andreas, a.k.a. Andrew. You would have to put one of these in front of each name. And the name of that grammar rule is called Granville Sharp. Because if this was allowed to stand, then it means that Peter and Jacob and Ioannis and Andreas were all the same person. And if you look at 2 Corinthians 13, 14, you see one of these in front of each member of the Trinity. So they're not a hydra-headed monster, okay? Three co-eternal gods. We should be calling them gods, plural. That's not polytheism. Polytheism is a bunch of unequal gods. Okay, these are co-eternal, co-infinite, co-everything that, that doesn't have any, you know, what do you want to call it, mixture. They're equal. They're infinite. It's a qualitative thing. And they don't have bodies in their godness. So they don't take up space. They're beyond time and space. Hopefully you all understand that. Okay. So, this does not belong. It's bad grammar. And some ding-dong just stuck it in because, I don't know, he was tired. So, that did. Mark didn't write that. Okay? Now, we got this next one. Now, here's one that's in there that I included. Now, listen to this one. See? Syllable counts. You'll notice. The syllable counts are themed even by themselves. 8 is the number of completeness. 19 is a prime number. 24 is the number of years to the millennium. When Mark writes, 12 is the number of, for the Jews. We all know that. 28 is the number of growth with uh, some 
trouble attached to it. It's half of 56. 18, of course, is a trinity meter. 11 is a, a special Greek meter for heroes. So, so also is 10. So he's mixing Greek culture and which, of course, you would expect. All right. I to told you why I don't put in a book like this. Okay, so this one, gar, means because of, therefore, it's technically called a post-positive conjunction. Okay, so look, poloi gar elusonte epi toi onomatimu. See the cadence? Poloi gar elusonte epi toi onomatimu. Okay? That's Trinity. Five is the, the number of what do you want to call it? Um, prophet. Christ is a member of the Trinity, so it's 15. It wouldn't be 15 if Gar weren't in there. So, Gar's in there. Mark wrote it. And you have to do some thinking with some of these things. Okay? But now look, it doesn't belong here. You know why? First of all, because this is 10 hero meter. Second, because you don't... Okay, here, how do I want to put this? It's fine to put it here. It's got the resonance and it makes sense. See, because it's like, For many will come in my name. That's how you translate that in English. For many will come in my name. You need the for there. In Greek too. Alright? But this... This sentence here says, and when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't, don't get all upset. Okay. These must occur, but the end is not yet. Okay, I don't need another car in there. There's n He's already just said the thing. I don't need because... I, I, you don't need to say it because it must. That this means it must. They means must. That it must happen, but the end is not yet. I don't need this. So Mark didn't write it. Okay, and he's also pairing off. See, he's doing his meters to pair off clauses. See, don't be. This one here says, don't be. Um, misled all right well this is tied to it in similar content don't be upset just like don't be misled it's not the end yet you're going to hear about it and it's not the end so don't be misled don't be upset it's not the end that's why it matters that this is 10 and this is 10 okay now down here mark likes to use and the, the Bible writers often like to use they do it in Hebrew a lot that's typical of Hebrew when you hear wa they call it va now it sounds terrible now the old fashioned version was called wa nice now they call it va me va you me and you va sounds terrible okay Kai think of bullet points you know, you got, you got, you make a bullet point, like, let's see if I can do one here, down here. I don't think I can do it. I'll try and do it here. Nope, I can't. Think of bullet points. Kai is, see, he says Kai here, and Kai again, and Kai again. Okay, so he's listing off things, okay? For there's gonna, for people, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and see, there will be earthquakes in various places. Okay, you need the and there to distinguish it from this category up here. See, and you and here's the gar again. The gar fits because now we need a because. All right, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be esonte, esontai. It's a better pronunciation. Seismoi, that's where we get seismology from in English. Katatopus, in various places. All right, 
And here's another kai, because there's another category. Esonte, limoi, kai, tarakai. I'll have to explain that in a minute. Arke, odinon, tanta, panta, tauta. Okay. And there will be famines and disturbances. It's got a lot of different meanings. And this word here comes from the from a word that Jesus used a lot, a verb called tarasso. This is a noun form, the cognate noun that goes with it. Taracas. All right. And it's got both a female and a male uh, gender. And it, it, there's a nuanced difference between the two. And but these are all the beginning of birth pangs. See birth pangs. Okay, well, tarakai has a connotation of something that's churning up in, inside you, wanting to come out, to spill out, to bubble over. It also ends up having a connotation of civil, civil disturbance, civil disruption that's happening within a people, within your soul, within a people, you know, all that. So this is perfect that it should be in the text. Okay, but... Textus Receptus and the majority text, these are mostly Byzantine manuscripts, the King James Bible included. They include it, but our older manuscripts don't have it. Now see, again, it's just like every human being, there's one or two things about you that are unique. And that's why you need to be around. That's why you need you should exist. Alright? The same thing is true. Every manuscript has something that makes it valuable all right in this particular case the majority the Robinson pinpoint majority text and the Textus Receptus which is the basis for the King James Bible have these phrases in them the Kai's and the Kai Tarakai it's perfect for the text here Odinon labor pains it belongs Mark wrote it I'll stand by that to my death Okay, even though it's not in the more older, venerated, um, technically speaking, Western, but the stupid King James only people call it Alexandrian. Uh, this Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus do not have this stuff that's in brackets. Well, maybe some copies of them do, but the ones I saw didn't. They belong in the text. They go with labor pains. It's right. Okay. Then we go here again, it's like, hi, we don't need gar here. Para dosusin gar he mas es. It doesn't even fit. Somebody must have been tired and just stuck a gar in the wrong place because he just likes writing the characters. Okay? Again, Kai. You don't need Kai here. They're going to deliver you over. They're going to deliver, the synagogues are going to deliver you over. You don't need Kai here. There's a Kai right here. See, somebody was tired. And instead of writing it just once here, he thought, oh, maybe I need to put it here. <coughs> While he's falling asleep over his candle wax. All right, see? And then there's another Kai here. How many Kais do you need in a sentence? You got one, two, three. And they all front nouns. So why is this in front of a verb? It, it does happen, but it's, it would have to have a special significance like in fact or even. Well, uh, no. He's just saying the synagogue's going to deliver you over. And you'll be in front of leaders, governors. The term is general. I mean, you know, like anybody who's a political leader or a military leader. Like Quirinius was. He was a military leader. Um, in charge of collecting the taxes and kings okay now you'll notice see this one is 22 and this one is 22 okay well this is about kings and this is about kings so it's kind of a no-brainer to figure out well no this extra guy doesn't belong there because I'm looking at the meter counts as well as the text that's what you're supposed to do okay that's how I know Mark didn't write this Kai there, and he didn't write that Gar there. Okay, because see here, you got 21. See, the meter patterns repeat. So you look at the text, 
you look at the meter count and it's like, well, okay, I got this word. Should I put it in there? Ah, uh, no. It doesn't belong in there. See, here's a 21. Here's a 21. This is about don't be afraid. All right? And that kind of matters because this next text says, be careful. Look to yourself. See to it. Because they're going to deliver you over. Okay, well, that's for your growth. 21 is a growth number. So if it happens to you, it's happening for your good. Well, that kind of matters then to see the 21 here. So it's not a 22. The 22 is about kings. Kings, see? This isn't too hard to do. A little painstaking. Okay, now we got our next stuff. Here's this text. Me de me le date. Don't practice beforehand. This is what that says in English. You know, translate it. That's in King James Bible and the Byzantine majority text. It don't belong here. You know why? This is Christ talking. See to it. Christ is telling you a bunch of stuff here. Christ never uses these words anywhere in the Gospels. Luke uses them a lot. Paul used them. Mark was around Luke and Paul. That's true. But the Lord is being quoted here and he didn't use them. So the Lord didn't say that. So I don't include it. I cross it out. The same thing here. Ag agosin. Is it agosin or did somebody just double write ag ago? Well, it could be either one technically. Okay? But I can't find the Lord ever using agago scene. It's the same verb, but it's a different tense. I don't find him ever using it. So since we're quoting the Lord, and we know this doesn't belong, and it's in the same text with this thing, we don't include it. It doesn't change the meaning. Because the, the, this thing, this word here, this is where we get premeditate from. Don't think over in advance and rehearse and yada, yada, yada what you're going to say once you get taken before the authorities. Okay? Don't do that. Don't figure out what am I going to say. Okay. So I don't need this text because it's repetitive, number one. But sometimes repetition is used on purpose. But I really don't need it because the Lord never talks that way. It's a perfectly valid word. Paul uses it. Luke uses it. And Mark would have picked it up and probably used it himself. But we're not talking about Mark's words here. We're talking about quoting the Lord here. So you leave it out. Alright, so that's why I crossed that one out. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop for now because I don't know if I'm recording at all. I can't see my recorder. So I'll c come back.